The last session is Vlad Kolesnikov talking about covert security with public verifiability. All right, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about two results in this area. Uh, the papers are called Covert Security with Public Verifiability, and one of them that says almost for free, that's uh, um, joint work with Alex Malazimov from uh, Asia Crypt 2015. And the other one is Cover Security with Public Verifiability, Faster, Leaner, and Simpler. That's our upcoming work uh, in Eurocrypt with Cheng Hong, Jonathan Katz, uh, Wenji Liu, and, uh, and Xiao Wang. So, um, Cover Security people know what it is. Um, this is clicking. Um, I'll, uh, it's a slightly different model, and I'll, I'll explain it. Uh, there is a not a very long line of work in this model. To me, it's a little bit surprising because I think the problem is really well motivated, um, and I'll motivate it as we uh, as we describe it, as I describe it. So, okay, so it's obviously inside kind of the area of, of secure computation. We know what it is. Uh, we want to compute the function without revealing the inputs. And um, I'll just give a really brief uh, overview because we're building on the garble circuits and the cut and choose way of, of doing things inside garble circuits. So I'll just I'll briefly review uh, what is going on uh, when we want to compute a function using garble circuit. Uh, there is two players, uh, Alice and Bob. And um, Alice is the circuit generator. She constructs a garble circuit. You can think of it as an encryption of a, a Boolean circuit that you want to uh, compute. The encryption includes the encryptions of all the wires of the circuit, including the input labels, the in including the input wires. And so um, we need to transfer those encryptions uh, to Bob, both for wires that are owned by Alice and owned by Bob. And some of it is done using oblivious transfer. Um, that's the functionality FOT that everybody knows. <clears throat> And then uh, we send the, uh, the garble circuit to Bob and then uh, and the wire labels. And Bob will evaluate this uh, garble circuit under encryption. OK, so this is uh, very well understood, uh, very highly celebrated uh, approach. It's, uh, it is secure against the semi-honest Alice and uh, against malicious Bob. OK, so. Um, the, the, what's the, what's missing here, well, that is that uh, Alice, in fact, can cheat um, if she wanted to, right? In the semi-honest model, we kind of assume that away. We assume that nobody cheats, so that is fine. But what we really want is a malicious model where whatever you do, right, you cannot gain advantage. Uh, but that's kind of expensive, so people looked at a covert model that was proposed by Alman Lindell in 2007. And that model kind of gives a very nice uh, trade-off, uh, I think, that uh, in the sense that a malicious party can cheat and, in fact, can succeed in cheating, but gets caught with the fixed probability. And then you can argue that it's depending on your uh, utility function, what you want to achieve with the secure computation, that a lot of the time you don't want to do it. And rational players will not. Uh, will not do that, okay? So in pictures, that's kind of the same as the protocol that players run, and we say that um, there is a deterrence factor uh, that um, cheating Alice, get if, if she's cheating, she's, she's going to get caught with some probability epsilon. Epsilon is non-negligible here, uh, and the probability 1 minus epsilon, um, she's, uh, she's able to cheat. And the point of this model is a trade-off with efficiency and um, much more efficient constructions are, are possible uh, in the covert model compared to uh, malicious. Okay. Um, so how does it work? It's, uh, it's kind of a simplified or the, the kind of the most naive or most natural way of uh, cut and choose protocol that you can do to, uh, to achieve this covert security. Okay. Because this uh, public verifiable co covert security, the topic of this, uh, I'm going to briefly review of what, what is, how the covert works. So now instead of uh, asking Alice to generate one circuit, we, Bob asks Alice to generate lambda circuits, where lambda is a parameter. You can think of it as a small number, perhaps two, 
or 10, right? Uh, and basically repeat everything that Alice does, uh, lambda times, uh, and send lambda garble circuits. Then Bob will choose at random a, a small number between one and lambda, and the number that he chose will be the circuit that he will evaluate. And he will ask Alice to open all of the other num uh, all of the other circuits, all of the other stuff that Alice sent Bob. And if Alice is not able to open, then uh, that means she's cheating, if she's not able to open them correctly. And Bob will have caught Alice. Okay, and if, uh, if she opens fine, then then uh, that means that with some high probability she was acting correctly. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's, that is very nice and it, it makes a lot of sense, but we can do a little bit better. Um, uh, or depending on your uh, model, we can argue that actually it's, it's significant uh, benefit if instead of just being able to catch Alice, what if we additionally are able to prove to anybody who wants to listen that Alice in fact cheated, right? So this way, now I, uh, I can blame somebody much more broadly, much more, you know, uh, will be available to, uh, to everybody. Like for example, if a bank, yeah. That means that security definition doesn't imply that the protocol is going Which, huh? It doesn't achieve proof. In a second. That's a good idea, uh, but <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so for example, if bank is doing something funny in your account, maybe they don't care if you stop being their client, right? But, uh, and if you leave, fine. But if, you're, if they cheat with you and you're able to post uh, the proof of that online, then that's a much, much more significant uh, deterrent for the bank. And I would argue that that's almost as good uh, as, as malicious model, as a malicious deterrent, just because how, how powerful it is. And you can put it on a blockchain. So that's, uh, <laughs> um, uh, seriously. <laughs> um, okay, so what we want is some kind of public verifiability condition, right, or property that if we catch Alice, then we can post it, okay? So it seems kind of obvious, like Mutu said, hello, it's obvious. And that's what I thought, actually, uh, and that's why I didn't write the first paper on this, because it turns out that this actually is not so obvious, and will, it will be clear uh, in a, a quickly. So, okay, so what, uh, so, but, so people who wrote the first paper is uh, Ashara Forlandi in Asia Crypt 2012. They define the model and give a construction. So what is the model? The model is that the Bob, uh, if he detects cheating, then he's able to... Uh, produce some kind of certificate, right? That certificate can then be shown to, uh, to a judge. The judge here is non-privileged, meaning that he doesn't know any kind of special secret. It just can be any member of the public, right? And uh, he can determine the judge whether or not the cheating in fact occurred, right? And of course it has to be, uh, security has to go both ways, meaning that Cheating Bob should not be able to frame Alice. So if, if Bob is misbehaving, then he, uh, he cannot simply, uh, if Bob is misbehaving, he, he cannot construct uh, uh, a proof of cheating uh, and blame Alice incorrectly. Okay, so that's the model. Uh, there is some subtleties how you define the model, but intuitively it's clear. And so one obvious thing to do, well, just ask Alice to sign everything uh, right, and then if she cheats, then you'll be able to show a couple of inconsistent messages, and that will be proof of cheating. So that doesn't work because when Alice is confronted, when Alice is asked to, re to prove something, she can abort, right, uh, without giving a signature. And so now Bob will not have signed conflicting messages between uh, Alice and Bob. Okay, so Naively, so straightforwardly, this doesn't, you, can, you know, you cannot just uh, ask Alice to sign ev uh, everything. You will not achieve public verifiability this way. You're saying soliciting a response. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, right. So, um, 
So this problem is solved by uh, Shara Forlandi by uh, saying that we, instead of OT, we're going to use something they call signed OT. Uh, <clears throat> so intuitively, the idea here is that we don't want Alice to know what we are asking. We don't want, because if we know we're asking, oh, show me index i, uh, then Alice can, oh, uh, that's index i. I, I've misbehaved on index i. I'm better not show my signature, right? So instead, what we want is that we, so we can we can put this query inside OT and uh, the, inside the oblivious transfer, the um, you know uh, Bob will choose the index that he wants to query, and Alice will have to provide kind of proofs as inputs to OT, and in this way, Alice wouldn't know uh, what what was being challenged. Still, that doesn't solve the problem because Alice can provide the input into the OT. So she knows, she, she's gonna prepare inputs. This input corresponds to index one, this input corresponds to index two, and so on. She's gonna say, oh, I'm gonna cheat in index i. So she's gonna provide input into the OT where the signature is invalid. So this doesn't quite solve the problem. You need the mechanism that we always obtain a valid signature no matter what Alice puts inside the OT. So if she puts a wrong thing inside the OT, fine. We're gonna get a signature on the wrong thing inside the OT. Yeah. So you will get the definition of proof that you also will get a proof that the sender got it without being malicious. Uh, so the the point is that if if uh, if the sender aborts uh, with the guarantee is that the sender never got an attempt to cheat, so the sender can always abort. That's not cheating. That's not cheating. Because the, the, there's, there's no advantage. You start at execution, you haven't learned anything, then you abort it, you know, fine. You could have aborted it in the very beginning. Nothing happened. You didn't get the chance to cheat and be caught. Um, so once we have this signed OT uh, primitive, then, um, then we can do what I said. We can push this querying, this challenge inside the OT and Alice cannot avoid this because she provides, uh, because her signature will come out in the end, right? Um, and so um, Ashara Forlandi realized this primitive using, uh, they, they, they build it based on uh, uh, Pikert Van Quinnatan Waters uh, maliciously secure OT protocol. So, Okay, so that's good. That's a big first step. Um, there is issues with efficiency here. Um, well, it's, it's an expensive protocol, and kind of importantly, it's not compatible uh, with OT extension. Okay, and everybody expects OT extension to work with their MPC, right? So, um, so because of that, the cost of, of the Shara Forlandi protocol is not that great. It's fine, it's, it's good in, in many cases, but you can do better. Okay, and so with uh, with Alex, we uh, we looked at that and we uh, we designed a OT extension, a signed OT extension, and I'm going to briefly um, say what we did um, at the high level. We did a bunch of other optimizations, but I'm not going to talk about it. Just high level how we how how the uh, signed OT extension works. So that's a little bit tricky because OT extension is is kind of very simple once you look at it for a long time but uh, at the immediately it's not that obvious but i'll do my best with pictures um so the ot extension works uh, there is a pre there's two ot's going on inside there is a pre ot uh, protocol like a preparatory ot that that is run uh, where the receiver prepares uh, a matrix here um, it has kappa columns, so kappa is going to be our security parameter. Think of it as a hundred, right? So he prepares a uh, hundred columns, um, and the, the, uh, just randomly chosen. The columns can be very tall, uh, and uh, the sender prepares a single kappa bit long string. Okay, and then what they do? They're going to run OT, where uh, it's going to run kappa OTs, where the input. On the sender, sender is going to play the role of the receiver. He's going to input uh, in each iteration, in each instance, he's going to input this in the, his bit SI and receive either the column that the sender chose or the column that the sender chose XOR R, where R 
is uh, a selection bit vector for the all the bunch of OTs that the, that the receiver wants to do. So receiver, remember in OT, has a M uh, bits. Those are the selection bits for the M OTs, where M is a million, right? And so this is a million tall, and this R is a million tall, and so you can XOR bitwise, okay? So what happens now, the first OT gives uh, to the sender, it gives a green column where a green column is either equal to the orange column or it's equal to the orange column XOR the, uh, the, bit ve the choice vector of R. The very cool observation here that if you look at what the sender received, if you look at it row-wise, then um, you can see that this row here, there's two options what could have happened. And it's uh, if R, if the choice bit in, in this jth row is equal, was equal to zero, then this green row is going to be equal to the orange column, uh, to the orange row being across the columns. And if Rj is, was equal to one, then it's going to be equal to this yellow uh, row of the sender XOR with the orange row of the receiver. This is a really simple, you just write it out, but for me at least it's always hard to imagine it immediately by looking at it, so just trust me. Uh, or can ask you while he'll, he'll, he'll nod and, uh, okay. So uh, the, the, the property here is that what we achieved is that we have, um, we've shared uh, some randomness between sender and the receiver where there is the, um, the receiver is thinking of one value and the sender has two possible values that, that uh, can match it or not and this kind of roughly corresponds to OT. And so the, uh, the sender will uh, use these two possible values, um, either the row that he received or the row that he received XOR with his uh, choice vector, right? He used that as two possible keys. And the property is that depending on the, uh, on the choice vector of R, it's the orange vector is either going to be equal to the green vector or to the green vector XOR orange vector, okay? And so if we use random oracle or something slightly weaker in the right way, then we can use that to encrypt. You can use it to generate a mask with which we're going to encrypt the actual secrets that we're sending and we're able to obtain OT. Okay, so this is a rough, uh, extremely quick uh, overview just barely enough so I can proceed to show where the signed OT component comes in, uh, in uh, signed OT extension comes in. So uh, what I presented is not, it's not maliciously secure, but it can be massaged in a way that people know how to do it into a maliciously secure protocol. So what we want to do now is we want to be able to, uh, to prove things. We want uh, Alice to be able to sign uh, we want to be able to force Alice to sign both input secrets that she's sending. So now notice we are in the situation where there are two explicit things that Alice is sending to Bob. And we can ask Alice to sign these two explicit things, right? So this YJ0 and YJ1. And if this is in contrast with the traditional way we're thinking of OT, where Alice provides two inputs, uh, to OT, and Bob receives one and has no information about the other one. That's kind of the, the functionality view, and that's how we will look at it. But here, two things are sent, and two things can be signed by Alice, okay? And we can abort if Alice's signature on Y, on either of the Ys, is not valid, okay? So you see where I'm going with this, that now Alice can sign things that she's sending to us, and we can refer to that signature. Okay, so now we're gonna say, this is not quite final, there's a couple of more touches we need to do, but for now we can say that the certificate that Bob is able to obtain after this uh, uh, OT extension is these two messages that she sent together with the signatures that, uh, that Alice provided on these, on these lines together with the orange row of Bob. So together all of this defines a signed uh, secret that that uh, Alice received that Bob receives. The, okay. 
So that's not good enough because there is big dependence on this, on the orange row, and nobody knows what this row is, and Bob can modify it however way he wants. Okay, so we want to prevent, so the next the finalization of this protocol is that we want to prevent, we want to uh, reduce or remove Bob's ability to massage this, right, to his advantage. Because if he, if he modifies this, right, what will happen is that effectively the message, when you decode what is being sent, will be not what Alice sent, right? And this way you can frame Alice. So what we have to do is that we have to now guarantee that Bob is not able to massage, to modify uh, this. So there's a difficulty because we cannot just reveal this because it reveals, so firstly, it reveals all the Bob secrets, right? So we cannot just reveal this orange uh, row. So, so our goal is we want to kind of bind, we want to tie Bob's uh, actions to these columns, right? But without revealing these columns. So one key insight here is that the sender, Alice, she already knows uh, some of the columns because the columns that uh, correspond to her choice bit equal to zero, she receives those columns. Okay, and right? So, um, so what we can do is that we can say that the, the orange row vector included by Bob in the signature, it must match the columns according to Alice's view. And if it doesn't match, that means Bob is cheating. Okay, but we cannot just um, um, reveal, so Alice cannot simply kind of include these columns into her signature because knowledge of these columns, or revealing what are these columns, reveals her it reveals information about her or, uh, yellow vector, about her secret. So we cannot do that. Well, we can because we can increase matrix size. We're not going to reveal all of them. We're going to re reveal just some of these columns, and it's going to be good enough. Uh, revealing some of these columns reduces our security. So our, our so the, the secret, the length of the secret that Alice has now has shortened. So we're going to compensate for it by having a slightly longer matrix. And that works out. Not quite. There is one more last thing that um, to win, the receiver doesn't have to fully change the, uh, the orange vector. He can flip a single bit of the orange vector, right? He still can win. But here we can solve it because we can restrict how this orange vector can be generated. So we, we, we don't allow it to be fully random. Uh, it has to be an output of some PRF or random oracle. We say we call it random oracle. Now we're done. So um, the way that now to put it all together, let me quickly click through because there's another construction I want to discuss, uh, is that the receiver generates this uh, orange matrix uh, in a way that this row is output of random oracle based on some secret key, right? Um, and then uh, they proceed as before, except so Alice signs the YJ0, YJ1. Alice signs the Ys that she's sending. But in addition, under the signature, she puts the index of the columns that she, um, that she wants to be fixed. She wants to be, these are the, the columns that uh, I know of. This is some of my zeros. And Bob's, uh, if, if Bob wants to provide a certificate, then his orange vector better match these columns that I have. So she does that. Uh, she declares those columns and the values of those columns. And so now um, Bob's certificate to be valid, it must match to so the output of the random oracle when, when Bob reveals everything, it must match those columns. Okay, so everything is uh, aligned uh, and, and works and the cost uh, overhead is relatively uh, modest, we have to have 76% uh, larger, wider uh, OT extension matrix. Um, there are a couple of things where we can do better, and this is sort of the motivation for, uh, for the new work, and this is what I'm going to talk about next. So one thing is that this construction, I, 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 walk, I, I talk through it very, very quickly, but I'm hoping the video will allow people to, you know, to, to uh, uh, rewind and, and look at it. So this construction is 
kind of highly detailed. The intuition here, I think, is reasonable, but when you actually implement it and look to the proof, is 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 quite um, is quite detailed, and its complexity is the enemy of security, kind of. It is also very is, is reliant and intertwined with the uh, OT extension protocol that we are using. And uh, if we're using a new or better OT extension protocol, then we need to redo everything. Uh, we did not provide implementation, partly because it was quite painful. Uh, and it has large witness. We didn't optimize for witness. And I'm, I'm not sure we can make it with the KM15 construction. And we do want short witness because blockchain, right? Um, so the new, um, the new idea is to approach is to get rid of all we know and let's start from scratch, uh, build from standard primitives, standard OT, standard everything. Um, and the main idea is that the, uh, the random seed, we're gonna, so everything, we're gonna de-randomize everything as much as we can. And uh, the random seed that is used for this construction is going to be the witness for everything. Okay, so how, well, again, we're going to use a cut and choose approach. Um, Alice will choose uh, lambda, so we're gonna do the semi honest thing, but uh, lambda times, right? Um, but now Alice, for sure, she's going to do, uh, all of her actions are going to be based on the random seed that she chooses. So she's gonna choose lambda uh, random seeds SI, right? Uh, uh, for each of the lambda instances. And, uh, and then she's gonna use that. Uh, uh, and um, we're going to get those SIs as witnesses, right? And if we find the contradiction in Alice's messages, that will be proof. So the only thing, now we're back to this thing, to the, the requirement that we need to, that I wanted to do before, is that we want to make sure that Alice always signs that SI. That's where we're always stuck. It always come back to it. How do we make sure that Alice signs it? So I'm gonna describe it in, in two steps. One, first I'm gonna explain how we just gonna catch a cheating Alice, and then I'm gonna say how we can prove uh, a cheating Alice. So we are here, we're basing it on, uh, um, on, on cut and choose, um, and Alice has lambda instances. So what we're going to do is that obliviously via OT, we're gonna allow Bob to learn all of the seeds SI that Alice uses in, in building her protocol messages, Right, except for one. The one that we don't learn is going to be used for, uh, for evaluation, okay? So suppose we are here at the stage, and now, and so we're not proving it. We're not, we don't, we don't, I'm not insisting on signatures yet. So once we're at this point, um, we, Alice's execution is deterministic once we know the SI, okay? And we detect cheating simply by reproducing what Alice should have done based on the C that we received, and if it's not this exactly the same that the messages that, that we're thinking about, then, then that means Alice is cheating, okay? Um, okay, so cheating is a deviation from the deterministic protocol. Fine, but that doesn't quite allow us to prove cheating, uh, so how can we do that? Well, we're gonna ask Alice to sign each message. That's a big step, but it's not everything because uh, Alice can still those original SIs that we are um, that we're talking about, we still need to have her signature on those SIs, right? And here is kind of the kind of the cherry uh, on the top idea. Uh, I mean, it's <clears throat> it's kind of natural, but uh, that's the, like the finalization of this. How can we force her? We um, we make Bob also deterministic. So Bob is going to derive his randomness from some seed SB. He's going to commit to that seed. So CB is a commitment of SB. And we're gonna ask Alice to sign that commitment. And now, if you think about it, um, the signature of Alice on Bob's commitment, together with signature of Alice on every message that she sends in this original OT protocol, right? It's essentially a signature of Alice on the message that is output inside the OT. Because the verification of the signature will be just to reproduce Bob's actions. And if Bob in real life was able to produce, um, to output some, something as output of OT, the verifier, given Bob's randomness, he can repeat that and obtain that same uh, output. 
And everything, everything is signed by Alice because Alice did sign Bob's, uh, uh, Bob's seed in the beginning. Okay, so this is, this is kind of the main finalization trick. There is a couple of, uh, there's a couple of um, um, smaller issues. So, okay, so for example, um, revealing Bob's seed, we need to reveal Bob's seed uh, to, to you know, as part of a certificate, right? Uh, but that's fine because we are, we're going to choose uh, different seed for every instance of the Lambda instances, right? And so we're not going to, rev uh, revealing those is not a problem because those are not real executions. Um, we, and we're not going to reveal the randomness that we use in the real execution, that's fine. And we, we have to reveal the inputs that Bob is using because that's part of the OT that, um, that, that Bob is, is participating in part of the signatures. But it's also fine because we, we, for the check instances, those are the ones that we care about, the OT inputs we're always going to set to zero. So there is nothing uh, to worry about, uh, about revealing. This is a defamation-free protocol. So if, if you just think about it for a second, uh, intuitively the reason is that um, Bob's certificate basically binds Bob to behaving honestly. So the verifier, uh, uh, right, because, because uh, Bob is deterministic and he committed to his randomness in the very beginning as part of certificate of, of cheating, he has to open this randomness. And uh, the verifier will see did Bob's, every Bob's message was uh, 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 consistent with Bob's randomness. And it only accepts the certificate if, in fact, it was. So that's, that's uh, the whole thing. I wanted to briefly show the performance numbers. And uh, they're very, very nice. Uh, the certificate is 354 bytes uh, long. Here is, um, this is the, trans uh, the transcript of the original OT. There is a couple of hashes of, uh, of some other OTs. Uh, C, the signature. So everything put together, it's, it's, um, it's a small, um, small secret size. Uh, it was implemented, I think, uh, partly, at least, um, I, I think that people weren't, uh, I think people really should be excited about the PVC, publicly verifiable covert. But partly maybe why they weren't is because implementation is kind of painful and it was not available. It is available now. The numbers are, you know, 5, 10, up to 60% overhead compared to semi-honest uh, and is comparable with covered. The, the difference in the ranges is because of how inputs uh, relate, you know, what's the size of the input relative to size of the circuit. But uh, it, it is very good performance. Compared to malicious, this is, uh, as far as I know, this is still state of the art. Uh, malicious, we're about, again, between six and uh, what about 17, I see here, uh, X uh, performance improvement compared to malicious, while achieving slightly smaller goal, but I would argue that uh, very, very similar uh, uh, security guarantee. Uh, the communication is almost uh, identical to, uh, to semi-honest. It's maybe a couple of percent uh, greater. Um, and well, with this, I want to conclude and say this is a great model. You should use it in all of your compilers and use it everywhere. It's available uh, uh, and open sourced. Thank you. Yeah. How much of this is specific to Yao's protocol? Can you compile other semi-honest protocols in this way by committing to seeds? Uh, to party? Sure. Anything. Um, I, I think so. We, I guess we didn't think about it because what else is there? But uh, yeah, I don't see any. I mean, you, you have to fit into this mold of you know, you have to hide it inside OT, uh, you know, the challenge go inside OT, right? And then Alice does, cannot avoid signing the, uh, her response. Well, it, it depends, yeah, so for our... So you take so, 10 to 60%, what was it for? Like, that's not probability, that's overhead. Yes, but for what probability? Oh, for one half, right, sorry. Um, I mean, we don't, so... We don't need to send extra circuit. We need to compute extra circuits. If you want to do one out of ten, then your computation increases. Your communication does not increase at all, right? Um, so I'm not 
sure what would be the performance hit there. Small factor. Um, yeah, it depends on the, how powerful is your computer computation. Thank you.